Good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us this evening um, for this celebration event for Hartford College's Unsung Heroes of Science 2020. I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Christopher Hollings, a researcher in the history of mathematics, and later this evening um, by Professor Alison Woolard, tutorial fellow in biochemistry here at Hartford. Uh, and the University of Oxford's academic champion for public engagement with research, um, as well as some of our excellent team here at Hartford. So uh, my colleague Nathan is joining us. Um, and of course, uh, all of you, all of our competition entrants, all of your supporters, um, and of course, everyone else, uh, you're all very welcome. As I'm sure many of you will know, Unsung Heroes of Science is a video competition run by us here at Hartford in which we challenge 16 to 18 year olds to make a two minute video about an underappreciated scientist, a real unsung hero of science. This evening, we're going to be announcing the winners of this year's competition. We're gonna have first, second and third prizes, highly commended, uh, an international prize and an audience award for the most watched video. So we've got a lot to look forward to. But for the first half of this evening's event, we will be hearing from Dr. Hollings about the anonymous mathematicians of ancient Egypt. So I think without further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to hand over to Dr. Christopher Hollings. Thank you for the, uh, the introduction um, and also for the, the invitation to, to take part in this, uh, this event. I've been browsing the, the videos on the website and been very impressed by them. Um, and so quite naturally this got me thinking about um, what does it mean to be an unsung hero so that the videos on the website all uh, quite naturally con uh, concern people whose names we know but I thought maybe it would be interesting to, to, to push this idea of unsung hero to an extreme and think about the people whose names we simply don't know so the people who contribute to, to science, to in this case to mathematics, and whose names simply don't come down to us, uh, like the people who devise the mathematics that people knew in ancient Egypt. Um, the benefit of this talk for me is that I get to talk about something that I find fascinating. So um, I will, I'll talk a bit about um, what mathematics people knew in ancient Egypt. I'll say a bit about how we come to know about it and about the people who, who did this mathematics. Um, okay, so to start with then, um, when people think about ancient Egypt, they probably think about something like this. So pyramids, uh, the Sphinx, maybe mummies, something like that. Um, but typically, I think people will not think about mathematics. Um, but people in ancient Egypt, uh, a small number of people certainly, but certainly people there, um, had some technical mathematical knowledge and skills. Um, the evidence for this is very, very small, but uh, it, it is there. Um, what evidence we have, we're lucky to have because it, it doesn't survive well over many thousands of years. Um, okay, so let's start with, um, first of all, a map of Egypt. Um, so uh, this is a map marked with the major sites of, of ancient Egypt, and you, you've probably noticed that it's a very long, thin country. It's dominated by the Nile. So this is a civilization that grew up um, along the Nile in the fertile regions along the banks of the Nile. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the, the sources that we might be interested in, things written on papyrus, for example, uh, do not survive well in the, this wet environment. Um, other things away from the river do survive, so we, we do have some evidence. Um, and so this is a, a civilization dominated by the river. And in fact, this is... Um, um, one of a possible reason for the development of geometry as well. Um, so this is an Egyptian field. Um, it's a, a modern field, but probably not too different from um, the, the fields as they would have existed in ancient times. Um, and so it's at the side of the Nile. It's the, the, the land is made fertile by the annual flooding of the Nile. Um, but the trouble with that also is that if people mark out their fields, their, their own individual fields that they that they own or that they tend, um, then the annual flooding of the Nile is going to obliterate those markers. So each year after the flood, you'll need to 
uh, mark out the land afresh each year. And so what the, some of the ancient authors tell us, so this is ancient Greek authors writing about Egypt, um, they claim that this is the origin of geometry, that people having to mark out new field boundaries every year um, led to the needs for surveying and a knowledge of geometry, of how to calculate areas and so on. And so in stories about Egyptian mathematics, there's a, a, a tradition of the so-called rope stretchers, so people who used knotted ropes to, to measure out uh, fields and, uh, and areas. Um, now, we don't know for certain whether this is true, um, but we do certainly know that uh, people in ancient Egypt knew how to calculate certain areas. And I'll, I'll come to this uh, point in, in a, a short while. Um, we also know other things. We know that they had certain arithmetic um, knowledge. We, know, we have a great deal of detail about Egyptian record keeping, so not just mathematical things, but record keeping generally. Um, and we have depictions of the people who did it. Uh, so for example, here on a, uh, the wall of a tomb, we have agricultural workers at the top, and then lower down, we have scribes recording um, what the, the agricultural workers are, are doing. Um, and so nowadays we, we know a certain amount about how, uh, how life generally in ancient Egypt worked, but the mathematics in particular, but this wasn't known for, for a very long time. Um, so as the centuries passed, as um, life in Egypt changed, uh, knowledge of the Egyptian language and hieroglyphs was lost over the centuries. So as we enter the common era, uh, there's very little real uh, detailed knowledge of what life was like in Egypt. Um, we only, people only knew the things that they could glean from paintings in tombs like this one and from, from other similar sources and from what ancient authors told us, but sometimes they're a little bit vague or a little bit unreliable. Um, and so the question of how we know what we know about Egyptian mathematics is something I, I find very interesting. Uh, it's not something I'm, I'm going to go into uh, in any great detail now, uh, except to say that this is part of this, the bigger 19th century story of the decipherment of, of hieroglyphs, um, which is a story of rivalry between English and, and French uh, scholars and, uh, and so on. But by the middle of the 19th century, people were again reading the texts that had survived from ancient Egypt. And in among those, you have some texts that show what the numerals looked like. So certainly by the 1830s, uh, scholars knew what Egyptian numerals looked like. And uh, in the case of the hieroglyphic numerals, um, they looked like this. Um, so it's, uh, it's a decimal system. It's based around powers of 10. And there are separate symbols for each of the <coughs> Excuse me, uh, each of the uh, first few powers of 10. So we have a very simple tally mark for one, we have this curved shape for 10, uh, coil of rope for 100, uh, lotus flower for 1,000, uh, crooked finger for 10,000, the tadpole for 100,000, and a, a man with his arms in the air for, for a million. And so if we want to put together a, a number using this system, we just repeat the, the appropriate symbol the, the number of times that we need. So in this example at the bottom, um, we have uh, eight uh, of the units, we have five of the tens making 50, we have four hundreds, um, eight lotus flowers giving us 8,000, uh, five fingers and two tadpoles giving us a grand total of 258,458. Um, and so you see these numerals on, on temples, on monumental inscriptions, and there's there's a nice example in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, so this is King Kazachem, who is a, an, an early king of Egypt. And there are some numerals down here on the, the plinth of the statue. So if we, we zoom in on this, um, this is um, in a very pictorial way. The king is telling us how many enemies he's defeated in defending the country. Um, and so you can see here there are, some, there are some tally marks down the bottom. There are nine of those. Uh, there are no signs for 10, but there are two coils of rope making 200. We've got seven lotus flowers in, in two clusters, and we've got four fingers. So he's claiming to have defeated 47,209 enemies, which um, may or may not be unlikely, but it's, it's a nice example of, uh, of the, uh, the, the number system in action. Um, 
Now, these, num these numerals are all well and good for monumental inscriptions, um, but they're not quite so handy for day-to-day -day use. They're a little bit clumsy to try to, to write by hand. And in fact, records uh, more generally are written in a much uh, a more joined up, a more, a more curved and quicker to write script called hieratic. Um, so it's the same language as that behind hieroglyphs, but it's just a different way of writing it. Um, and so here uh, are some examples of what the, the, the hieratic numerals look like. And as you can see, they're a lot more compact, they're easier and quicker to write than the hieroglyphic numerals. Um, now I mentioned these only very briefly, um, partly because <clears throat> um, I'm going to say a little bit very shortly about Egyptian scribes, and this is the kind of thing that they would have written, and most particularly the mathematical text that I'm going to uh, talk about in a moment um, is written in this kind of script. Um, okay, so by the middle of the 19th century, um, Egyptian numerals were were identified. They, they've been identified in the scripts, both hieroglyphic and hieratic, um, but not much else. So nobody really knew how the ancient Egyptians did mathematics. What did they know? How did they do arithmetic? Um, what uh, geometry did they know? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then in the 1850s, a papyrus was found um, in Luxor um, in Egypt, which is around the middle of the map that I, I showed you uh, near the beginning. Um, and this was uh, found by a Scottish archaeologist called Alexander Henry Rind, um, and is now known as the Rind Mathematical Papyrus, and it's in the British Museum. Um, it probably came out of a tomb somewhere near Luxor, which is probably why it survived. Um, and it's, um, it's a compendium of arithmetical and geometrical problems that a scribe might have had to, to deal with during a, a career. So for example, there are problems about how to divide up rations between workers. So either in, in equal proportions or in situations where uh, one worker might get more rations than another. So there's an uneven distribution that, that's to be worked out in some cases. Um, there are calculations of areas and volumes. So for example, there are calculations for the volume of a container that will uh, hold grain, uh, so that the you know, volume of grain that this will hold. Um, and in among all these problems, you get a very good idea of how Egyptian scribes were able to do arithmetic, what were the techniques that they used. Um, in particular, we've got a, a very good idea from this papyrus of this, a very elaborate system of, of fractional calculation that Egyptian scribes would use, which is something you would want to know about if you're dividing up rations. Um, one thing I should perhaps have said about uh, Alexander Rind, the, the archaeologist who discovered this papyrus, is he's, he's very much a, a pioneering archaeologist at a time when there wasn't really any such thing as a professional archaeologist. So he is um, another figure who could perhaps be presented as an, an unsung hero, but I, I won't uh, go into that now. Um, so what I thought I would do next is rather than talking very vague terms about mathematics, I would give you a sense of what um, Egyptian scribes actually did. So I'll give you an example of how they would perform arithmetic. <clears throat> so to take a simple example, suppose you wanted to multiply seven by 10. Um, so what you do is you pick one of these numbers, doesn't matter which one, let's say we pick seven, and we write it down next to a number one. And these two numbers are going to form the tops of, of two columns of numbers that we're going to construct. Um, so we can do things to these numbers. For example, we can double them. So we just double them both, write them down, write down two and 14. Um, we can double them again to give four and 28. We can double them again to give eight and 56. Um, and you might wonder where this is going. Well, we're trying to multiply seven by 10. So we, and we haven't used the 10 yet. And so the idea of what we're doing here is we're, we're looking for numbers down this first column that will add up to 10. And of course, we have them here. We have the two, we have the eight. Um, so let's mark off those rows. So if we add the two and the eight together, we get 10. And in fact, if we move over then to the second column and add together the, the corresponding entries over there, so the 14 and the 56, we get the answer that we're looking for. So this is how you, you perform 
uh, multiplication uh, in, in ancient Egypt. It doesn't rely on memorizing uh, times tables like we do. It's, a, it's a, in some ways a more mechanical process where you, you do this sort of two column arrangement of, of numerals. Um, of course, we didn't have to start with the seven. We could also have started with the 10, and put the 10 up there and then looked for numbers down this column that would add up to seven. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, doubling also is, is not the only operation that we'd be allowed to perform in doing this. So in moving from one row to the next, we could also multiply by 10 or divide by two and va various other things that we're allowed to do, but very simple operations that we can perform in this way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that, that's a very simple arithmetical example. Um, to give a, a geometrical example, this is something from the Rhine papyrus. And in fact, this is from the problem that I mentioned briefly before about calculating the volume of a, a container uh, for grain. Um, and in fact, it's a cylindrical container. And the way the scribe works this out is by first working out the, the area of the circular base of the container and then multiplying that by the height, just in the way that we would do. So at the start of that, he has to work out the area of a circle. And so this is partly what's going on here. Um, you might recognize what we have here in, in the picture are some of the hieratic numerals that we saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, and in fact, these are, th this is arithmetic in the two column arrangement that I, I just showed you with, uh, with our numerals, but here it is happening in, in uh, hieratic numerals. Um, this is involved with, with calculating the area of a, a circle. And so the standard way that an Egyptian scribe would find the area of a circle is to take eight ninths of the diameter and to square it. And of course, we know now that this is not exactly the area of a circle, but it's a pretty good approximation. It's a very useful uh, way of calculating it. So if, for example, we were to take a circle with diameter one, then the area would work out to be 0.79. If, on the other hand, we work out the area in the modern way using the formula pi r squared, where r is the radius of the circle, then we get the, the accurate answer of 0.785. So 0.79 is a pretty good uh, approximation to that. Um, okay, so I seem to have wandered into um, mathematics and wandered away from scribes. So let's go back to um, the scribes. So this is the picture we had before with the scribes in the middle recording the, the work of, of agricultural workers. Um, so what can we say about scribes? Who were they? What did they do? How did they train? And so on and so forth. Um, and in preparing for this talk, I thought, well, I, I will ask this question of an Egyptologist. And I got back a very uh, a long and detailed answer, uh, which I can think I can best summarize by saying it's complicated. Uh, the term scribe covers quite a few different possibilities. Um, and we can get a sense of this by looking at the different ways that um, depictions of scribes have, have come down through the centuries. So we have the, this picture on a, a tomb wall uh, for one example. Another example is in this model of a, a granary, which comes out of a, a tomb. It was placed in the tomb as a, um, as a guarantee of a supply of food in the afterlife. So it's uh, it's a de depiction of, of workers um, making bread uh, in, in a granary. Um, and so we have the workers doing the work and then sitting in the corner, we have the scribe recording what's going on. So here he has his, uh, his writing board. He has his, uh, his stylus that he's writing with. Um, and in fact, some of these uh, writing boards and, and, and pens do survive. So it's quite nice to be able to, to look at the um, the paraphernalia associated with scribes. So to take an example of the, the writing board, this is uh, an example in a museum in New York. It's a student's writing board, and we can still see that it has uh, a writing exercise on there. Um, and these boards were, were repainted to be reused. And on the one side here, we have um, evidence of the, the previous use of the, of the board. So it's quite a nice thing to look at. Uh, we notice uh, something that will be relevant in a second. There are two different colors of ink here. So there's, there's black ink, there's red ink, and these are, um, uh, it's very normal to see two colors of ink in, in these kinds of, uh, of situations. So in the mathematical papyrus, 
uh, the working out might be done all in, in black ink and then the, the answer written at the bottom highlighted in red, for example. Um, so it's not just um, uh, writing boards that we have, we also have uh, the pen sets as well. So this, uh, this is an example of a, of a pen case that has survived. Uh, the scribe would write with, with pens made from reeds. This is a, a case for them. Um, and there are two little pots for the ink at the top there, uh, probably one for black and one for red. As I was saying, two different colors of, of ink were used. And I, I think this is a, a particularly beautiful uh, um, object, which I'm, I'm very happy to, to show a picture of. Um, so we've got some sense of what the scribes did from, from objects uh, associated with them. Um, and the, the title scribe could, could cover a range of different things. It could be um, a fairly ordinary uh, worker who, who simply wrote things down and, and made records, perhaps like the, the scribe sitting in the corner of the, the, the granary. Um, and this is simply a scribe as an ordinary worker. So they're, they're, they're given the title scribe as a way of distinguishing them from the more ordinary craftsmen or laborers. So that the scribe is, is a bit different in that they're one of the, the very tiny proportion of the population who could actually read and write at this stage. And you certainly call them unsung heroes because that their names just don't come down to us. On the other hand, the scribe could be a much more high ranking official, somebody who oversaw the working of the, of the more lowly scribes. And in some of those cases, we do have names. Uh, so for example, this is a scribe whose name we know. His name is Nebamun, um, and he was an accountant, uh, again, of, of granaries at the state temple at Karnak, which again is, is roughly in the middle of the, the map that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and he's um, uh, an elite official. Uh, overseeing the work of, of more lowly scribes. Uh, and one thing I like about this picture is, of course, that we can see his pen case uh, tucked under his arm. So he has the, um, the equipment of a, of a scribe in, in very plain view. Um, what I didn't say earlier, though, uh, to go back to the, the Rhine papyrus, is that here again we have an example of um, a scribe whose name we know. So I've highlighted it there in red. Um, his name is Achmos, and he, he's, he's written there in, in hieratic text. Um, and that's about all we know about him. Um, we, we don't really know anything other than his name and the fact that he wrote out this papyrus. Um, he may have been a senior scribe. It may be that the reason this papyrus has survived is the fact that it was placed in his tomb, and that's how it was preserved. Um, but what we can say is that he didn't come up with the mathematics in this papyrus, and he doesn't claim to, um, because he, he tells us in these, these introductory passages at the beginning, he tells us that actually this is a copy that he's made of a papyrus that's a couple of hundred years older. So probably he doesn't know who devised the mathematics that he uh, is describing here. Um, and so, in fact, the origins of Egyptian mathematics are are pretty much unknown, uh, lost in the, in the mists of, of history, certainly devised by people whose names are not remembered. Um, people, for example, uh, like this scribe. Um, and so this is my, my final slide. I'm, I'm quite happy to, to finish with um, uh, what is a, a very striking, I think, uh, image of a, a depiction of a scribe. Um, there he is with a, the roll of papyrus in his, his hands. Um, and this dates from a, a very early stage of Egyptian history, um, and he, there is no name attached to him. He's, he's completely anonymous. Um, and so I think it's quite nice to, to end with him, uh, to, to stand as a representative, or, or perhaps sit as a representative um, of the anonymous scribes who devise this mathematics that uh, I've been talking about. And perhaps we can take him to uh, be representative of um, anonymous writers more generally, sort of the, the, the ultimate unsung heroes, if you like. Um, and so I, I think I'll stop there and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Chris, for a really wonderful insight into a world that I certainly had had never really come across, <coughs> the, the, the maths of ancient Egypt. So we have got a couple of questions coming in. Um, Everyone, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. And if you see a question there you like the look of, you can upvote it so that we, we can make sure that we uh, answer all of the most 
popular, most interesting question. So, um, first question is from Lamise. So why did Egyptians draw or paint all of those pictures? Was it with the intention to show people in the future? Or what was their motivation? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I, so I'm not, I'm not an Egyptologist, so that's the, the first um, uh, excuse I should make. Um, I think probably, yes, it was to, to show people in the future. And I think um, um, the, the paintings are also part of, um, if they're in a tomb, they're part of showing who the, the tomb owner was and um, sort of, I think helping them through to the afterlife by may, maybe showing how affluent they were and that they could afford this kind of thing as well. <clears throat> so you mentioned there that you're you're not an Egyptologist by trade. Um, so how did you get how did you get into this line of work? Um, how did you transfer to maybe being a historian of maths rather than a mathematician? Um, I I sort of wandered across from uh, from being a mathematician to looking into the history of the mathematics that I had worked in, um, and then this. The, this work now is it's something happened completely by chance um, that um, I, I discovered some letters written by well uh, Egyptologists um, earlier in the 20th century and started talking to a, a friend of mine about them who's an Egyptologist and then it sort of spiraled from there and uh, it gradually taking off my life I think. Um, Are there a lot of people working in your field or is it a relatively small field? Um, history of mathematics relatively small um, and so the Egyptian aspects are even smaller. Um, I think it's history of maths is a, is a bigger subject in other countries than it is in the UK. It's quite quite small here. <clears throat> if we go back to to the Egyptians and their marvellous mathematics, um, what what did they use it for other than for things like calculating the area of fields <laughs> or um, the volume of a grain container? What else did Egyptians use mathematics for? Um, it's so that it, keeping track of um, of goods produced, I suppose. So numerical accounting, um, distribution of, of rations, um, the area and volume calculations, as I said. Um, there are hints here and there, and this is maybe slightly contentious, but there are hints here and there of them just playing around with numbers and looking at properties of numbers. Um, uh, so there, there could be a recreational aspect, but uh, it's, it's hard to know. <clears throat> Fair enough. Um, how did scholars decipher these hieroglyphics in the first place? How did they work out that these were representing numbers rather than anything else? Um, I'm not sure about that. I think there's, so the, the, the famous story, of course, is the, connected with the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum of having uh, three parallel, or well, the same text in three different scripts, and one of them could be read, and that was part of the story of how people got a window into this. Um, I think, uh, I think from what I've seen, um, the, the idea of the one little stroke as a tally mark is an easy way in to say that this is this, isn't, this stands for one, and then it's repeated a few times, it stands for smaller numbers, and then that sort of allows people to, to prise open the, the text. And if they happen to know a little bit about what comes later, they can then begin to guess that this must mean 10, and then just slowly, little by little, filling in the pieces. <clears throat> and so is that how, how we worked out that we were talking about factors of 10? Because it seems, from what you showed, we clearly sort of um, understood those symbols in that way, but is there clear evidence that they are factors of 10? Uh, yes, I, I think so, yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, I, I think everything has to be looked at in its, in its context, and if you've managed to gain some idea of what a document is about, generally speaking, and if you know that if it, it's, a, uh, it's a list of workers who work on a particular building project, and it, it looks like a list, and there are things at the beginning of each line that look like numbers. That's the you know the way that you begin to to, to get an idea of what the thing says overall. <clears throat> why do you think they used? I mean, maybe this is a bit reading a bit too much into it. But why do you think they used powers of ten? Because some other ancient civilizations, I believe, used powers of twelve instead. 
Um, do you know whether whether 10 meant something to the Egyptians or whether it was just convenient or numbers of fingers or anything like that? Um, I don't know if it has any special significance. Um, it's usually, uh, I mean, using base 10 is a very common thing around the world for the sort of the reason of fingers and that I would imagine that's that's the reason for it. Um, so the the parallel system in ancient Mesopotamia is a, a base 60 system um, which is probably developed because 60 has lots of divisors so you can you can do lots of calculation and never have to deal with fra awkward fractions. Um, the Egyptian system on the other hand had a very well developed system of calculating with fractions which they, they ended up with because it was base 10 and then that probably for reasons of number of fingers I would imagine. <clears throat> Did they have a number zero or did they have negative numbers or was it just positive numbers and fractions? Just positive numbers and fractions. <clears throat> Very interesting. Um, when, did, when did Egyptian multiplication methods progress to modern day methods? Is it something that was lost or was there a sort of a progress through to how we do things now? Um, I think there's some traces of it in ancient Greek mathematics. I think it um, that it, the some of the fractional arithmetic. Um, so the um, essentially the Egyptian system of fractions only had what we would call unit fractions, so one over something, uh, which meant that if you did a calculation, you would have to uh, that that would result in something that for us is a non-unit fraction you have to express the result entirely in terms of unit fractions. And so this is, there are very uh, well-developed systems for doing that within Egyptian arithmetic. And then that carries over into Greece. So you see in later centuries, you see um, people uh, trying to stick to unit fractions when it's a little bit odd as to why they would want to. Um, and it's, it's a sort of legacy of, of Egypt. Um, probably not that's probably not so much a, a great influence moving into the into modern times um i think the bigger influence comes from mesopotamia where um that number system was used in an astronomical context um and so that's that's one of the reasons why we end up with 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour because it goes back to that base 60 calculation so that that's the bigger influence not not so much the the egyptian side of things <clears throat> How do you think modern maths would be different if we still used ancient Egyptian methods? Um, it, well, it would be quite different. Um, uh, learning to do arithmetic would be very different as well, um, in that we, our way of doing arithmetic is very heavily based on learning times tables. So we know all these very small multiplications. We know what six times four is and all that kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that anything like that happened in Egypt in that there's a, there's a very a systematic method of doing things in two columns, either by doubling or multiplying by 10 or, or whatever. Um, um, so it would be, possibly you would have to learn, it, spend less time learning how to do arithmetic. Um, quite where the mathematics would go after that, is, I, I'm not sure really. <clears throat> Excellent. Right. What else have we got by way of questions? A question here from Mark Everin. Were they the first to approximate pi to such an accurate degree? Um, that's an interesting question because it, it is often stated that there is an Egyptian value of pi, uh, which comes out of that, um, the, the calculation I showed you, so eight ninths of the diameter squared. Um, but there isn't really any evidence that the Egyptians ever calculated pi at all. Um, it's, uh, it's very much a modern imposition on the, the material to, to say that th there is an Egyptian value of pi. So there's no evidence that they ever um, thought about the um, ratio of the circumference of a circle to its, its diameter or anything like that. Um, you again have to move, I think, to ancient Greece to a, a few centuries later to, to get the first approximations to pi. <clears throat> Did they ever deal with algebra or trigonometry? Um, you've shown that they did do counting <laughs> and they did arithmetic, but did they do 
more complex maths like algebra and trigonometry? Um, trigonometry, I don't think so. No, as far as I can remember. Um, algebra, again, this is another slightly contentious point in the, in the literature on this, that there are certain problems um, that you can interpret in algebraic terms. And there's a big question mark over the extent to which that is the way that Egyptians viewed the problem. So you might have problems that look like um, uh, find two numbers that add together to make this and that multiply together to make this. And of course, the way we would solve that is we would write down some equations and we'd substitute one into the other and, and solve the equations. So there are problems like that but there's a big question mark over whether there's really anything algebraic there. Um, I think most people who study this would say no, but that the people would say yes. So it's a, it's a difficult point. <clears throat> Very good. Um, another question. So throughout your talk, you were referring to scribes as you, you were saying he, when you were talking about scribes and you showed us some pictures of um, male scribes. Were they all men? Were there any women doing maths in ancient Egypt? Um, as far as I know, sadly, it was all men. Yes. Um, yes. I, I, some part of me expected that question to come up, actually, because I, I <laughs> as I was talking, I was conscious of always saying he. Um, but yes, I think as far as I know, at least it, it was all men. Well, <laughs> when you're presenting this in a, in a forum that is dedicated to celebrating unsung heroes from across the world, then the kind of question that's bound to come up mm. Okay, I think we've got a couple more questions here about the history of maths in general. Um, so, why is the study of the history of maths important to us today? Um, well, it's, it's important to know where things come from, where, where, where we come from, where ideas come from. Um, so I think it has, a, it has an, in, an interest in of itself, um, but it's also quite, uh, can be quite important for um, uh, the study of mathematics. I think if you um, if you can guide people studying mathematics through some of the difficulties that people have had in the past and you can you can get them to the the modern ideas by uh, taking them through a historical path sometimes and that's maybe um, a more intuitive way of learning mathematics than simply being presented with here is the modern idea and having to learn that straight off. <clears throat> what would you say is the most fascinating fact that you've come across in the history of mathematics? Oh, um, can I come back to you in <laughs> 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 one's time about that one? Um, the, the things that, the sorts of calculations that Egyptian scribes could do with a mathematical toolkit that compared to the modern one it is quite limited, uh, the, the facts that they could do the, the kind of calculations they could do with that I find fascinating. Um, so yeah, so that's not a specific fact, but it's a, it's a sort of a general uh, sort of general thing that it, it amazes me. <clears throat> so it, what was it that drew you to, to studying the history of math? Um, I, I think that's probably the same answer as, um, as to the question about why study it. It's, I, I feel like it's important to to know where things come from. Um, so as I said, I, I did at one point study um, the history of the branch of mathematics that I'd worked in um, because nobody had, and I, I thought it was important to, uh, to see where that came from. Uh, um, and it is all fascinating, I think. It's just a, a, a really interesting subject. <clears throat> Um, what are some good resources that people can use to um, to read more or learn more about this? What can you offer us any recommendations? Um, so on on the history of mathematics generally. Uh, yeah, perhaps we can start there, and then maybe if you've got anything for specifically the history of maths in ancient Egypt, I'm sure that would be quite fascinating. Um, so history of mathematics generally, that there are a lot of very good books out there. But there's also um, the the Mac Tutor archive on the St Andrews University website, which has um, biographies of historical mathematicians. Uh, it's constantly being added to. Um, it has pages that deal with specific topics as well. So I, I, I imagine there's a page there on Egyptian mathematics, um, and it's very 
very nice accessible way of getting into some of these topics and they do give lists of, of things you can look at you know other web pages to look at other books that you can can look for um, so that would be a good way to find out about more things about Egyptian mathematics um, there's also quite a nice book out there um, I forget the author's name but it's called count like an Egyptian and it's a, it's a very nice introduction to Egyptian arithmetic, um, going much, much further than just the one example that I gave. And uh, so the, the author waxes lyrical about the, the marvel of, of Egyptian arithmetic. <clears throat> that all sounds excellent. Um, so this one from anonymous attendee, uh, where did the hieroglyphs come from? For example, in ancient China, their numbers were supposed to symbolize different things hence their shape. Is it the same thing in Egypt? Um, that's a good question. So specifically the numerals. Mm. Um, um, I honestly don't know. I'm sorry, that's not, <laughs> not a very good answer. But uh, no, I, I'm, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I think w the, the numeral for one is, is probably fairly straightforward. Um, but um, no, I don't know. I, I feel like I need to go and Go and look this up afterwards now. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> That's quite all right. That's one of the wonderful things about research, isn't it? That can, questions and answers come come around from everyone. Um, oh, here's a nice one. Uh, have you ever studied the history of maths? Sorry, have you studied the history of maths just in ancient Egypt? Or there, are there other time periods that you studied? Um, well, ancient Egypt is, is quite a new topic, relatively new topic for me. I, I've mostly, uh, I, I've mostly been in the 19th and 20th centuries up to this point. So, so quite, quite a long way from Egypt. Um, and so I've looked uh, one time at 20th century Russian mathematics, but also have increasingly moved into um, Britain in the 19th century uh, is one of the other things that I've, I've done. <clears throat> Excellent. Maybe, maybe you can give a talk for us sometime about, about that bit instead. Um, We'll cover the whole scope of your research before <laughs> before too long, I'm sure. Um, okay, and I'm going to make this our final question. How was maths used in engineering problems in ancient Egypt, like building the pyramids and the passageways inside them? Um, that's a very good question to which we don't, we simply don't know. Um, those, the evidence of that has not come down to us at all. So it, it's one of the big gaps in what we know. Um, you would think that there would be some very detailed engineering mathematics of some kind in the construction of the pyramids, but we, we simply don't know. We don't have any evidence of it whatsoever, I'm afraid. <clears throat> well, there we go then. Um, what a lovely note to finish on. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hollings, for a very insightful talk and for taking all of our questions. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, I know it's difficult being put on the spot sometimes, um, with a barrage of questions. So we do appreciate you um, doing your best to answer all the, the um, fascinating questions that we've had in from everyone. And thank you everyone for sending in such a lovely set of questions. It was really, really insightful, I think.